Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. On this week's episode, we welcome Cheshire Academy's coach, Jim McCarthy, to the podcast. Jim played his basketball at Hamilton, which is a D3 school, and right after graduation, he coached at Williams under Coach Dave Paulson and actually was there when they won the national championship. He then coached at Yale, Northeastern, and Towson before taking over Cheshire Academy a few years ago. In this conversation, we talk about what it takes to be a D1 player, the differences between D1 and D3, what it means to be a preferred walk-on, uh, recruiting at the prep school world, the differences between AAA, AA, single A, and much, much more. Great conversation with Jim. He's one of the good ones out there um, that I really trust his opinion, and uh, it was a great conversation. If you like this podcast, feel free to subscribe at any of the major podcasting platforms and also you can subscribe at my youtube channel and anytime you need to reach me feel free to contact me via the prep athletics website which is prepathletics.com now we welcome coach mccarthy to the podcast welcome to the prep athletics podcast this is Corey heights some battles I'm, I'm i'm not sure if they got us if they did maybe maybe so you will get better as a player during that year so it was kind of exciting like oh yeah somebody wants me Jim, welcome to the program. Thanks very much for having me, Corey. Yeah, we have uh, known each other for a while, and um, you do a great job at Cheshire Academy up there. But before Cheshire Academy, you were actually a D1 assistant. What actually made you want to get into college coaching? Um, I, I played at a Division three school, Hamilton College, and I was kind of always in, in person. I kind of gravitated towards my coaches. You know, I'm still in touch with my middle school coach and high school coach and my AU coach came to my wedding uh, you know so I knew I wanted to teach and coach and um, I actually got a teaching job for about a week at a middle school in Long Island teaching history and coaching uh, basketball so Cheshire's kind of come full circle with that but um, I had an opportunity to coach at Williams College like right out of right out of uh, Hamilton which is you know one of the best division three programs in the country I was 22 um, it was part-time and and uh, Dave Paulson was the head coach. He actually was most recently head coach of George Mason. And, and I had the teaching job too. And I was kind of going back and forth. And he just said, hey, you know, if, you, if you're going to do this, you probably got to do it now. Because when you're 32, <laughs> you're not going to want to <laughs> start back, you know. So um, I got into coaching. was at Williams for two years. Uh, was part-time, was substitute teaching, was the JV coach. Um, learned a ton about basketball. We'd actually played them when I was at Hamilton. So it was you know, kind of interesting to be coaching guys that I knew and have played against and having to navigate that relationship. Um, and then after my second year, we, we won the Division Three National Championship. Um, and I went to Yale um, in the Ivy League for three years. Um, for the first time, the first two years was a volunteer assistant. So in the Ivy League is unique because they have two full-time assistants. And then the third assistant is volunteer. And this was even before the ops position, I think, in, in those schools, it was probably 2003. So if you can make it work in live, it's a great opportunity because someone who's 24 or 23 can get in at division one, you know, which you couldn't, if it was a full-time, <laughs> you know, salary benefits position. So um, it was the same thing. I work in a school in New Haven from about nine to 12, um, come in for practice. Uh, we saw the new film exchange. Then we would send out <laughs> VHS tapes and, um, but you could scout, you could recruit, you could be on the court. Um, James Jones is still the head coach there. Uh, he was awesome to work for. Um, got to know obviously the other assistants that were there um, and then started to get to know other, you know, kind of coaches in the, in the college coaching world um, through recruiting and through scheduling and, and playing games. Um, and then my last year there, I was full-time. The person above me uh, left for a, a job at Eastern Kentucky and then I was a promoted to full-time spot. Um, and then from there, I went to Northeastern University. So I grew up outside Boston, the head coach who got the Northeastern job was Bill Cohen. He's still there as well. So he played at Hamilton. So it was um, kind of the connection of, you know, where you go to college, um, you know, helping you, um, when you when you're in the real world. So uh, I was at Northeastern for seven years, uh, which was awesome. Uh, in the Colonial, it was a great league, VCU, ODU. Uh, those schools were, were still in at that point, George Mason. Um, we had some success there. Went to two, two NITs, won the regular season title my last year. And then I decided to go to Towson University from there. Uh, just felt like um, I hadn't moved yet. Wife and a couple of kids was kind of feeling a little antsy. Like I need to, um, you know, if I stay here, which would be great, but it's going to be harder to move the older I get. So 
um, went down to Towson for four years, which was a great introduction to basketball in that area. I know you coach down there, but um, Baltimore, Virginia, DC, great teams, great high school programs. Um, and was there for four years uh, until 2017 and then moved back up to Connecticut uh, where my wife's from and um, coached at University of New Haven for one year, which was division two. Um, so I've coached at all three levels. Uh, and then the summer after my first year in New Haven, I uh, was able to get the, the job here at Chester. So it's been, a, so I think it's 17 years in college, I think 14 in division one or, or something close to that. So uh, division one, two, and three, they're all different. They all have their strengths and weaknesses, but I, I feel lucky that I was at each, you know, kind of at each level and, and working for different people. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that background. So you're in a unique position that you coached at both Williams and in an Ivy League school. What's the difference between that level of player from the D3 high level, from the high level D3 to the Ivy? Like what really separates those two? Um, it's a good question. I think it's, they were probably a lot closer when I was at Williams at that time. You know, I think the Ivy League has really um, has become more like probably the Atlantic 10, you know, than the NESCAC as far as the caliber of players that are, that are choosing to go there. So, um, you know, when I was at Williams, we cross a little bit with, you know, maybe some Dartmouth or Columbia or it was Williams and Amherst and kids were kind of looking at the Ivy League and the NESCAC. You know, now I feel like kids are looking at the Ivy League or, you know, the WCC or the A-10 or the MAC, um, you know, so I think like anything, it usually is, um, you know, size, uh, athleticism, um, maybe physically where guys are at. You know, I think certainly when someone's a junior or senior and a, and a you know, a starter on a top 25 division three team, they can play most places, <laughs> you know, in the country, maybe not when they're 18, you know, uh, or maybe a chance to play earlier in their career, you know. Um, but I think usually for, for division one, or at least for that, um, kids in that kind of academic mold, um, you know, size for their position, you know, you're 6'6 six, six or 6'10, six, um, really having an, an, something that you're elite at you know, I think is really important. So what's going to be your, what's going to be your signature, you know, when, when, a, when a coach from Yale is evaluating you and they're evaluating four or five guys and they're making their pro con list and they're going through it. What are you, what are you better? Uh, what do you do at a high level? You know, what do you do at a division one level, whether that's division one athlete, division one shooting, division one playmaking, you know, there's gotta be something that when you're being recruited or when they're going to put you in a game or as an assistant, when I look down the bench and say, Hey, we got to get Corey in there. What are we going to get? You know, um, so I think that's what, <clears throat> and now that's really throughout the country, you know, because yeah. we're the world in some ways, right? If you're Yale or Williams, you can recruit anywhere in the country, California. Even when I was there in 20, 2002, you know, we had a kid from Nashville, Ohio, California, and this is at Williams, you know? Um, and so it's, it's, it's national, you know, they're both national programs. So, um, but I think that's usually the difference is kind of the one, the one difference maker that kind of separates you from, um, you know, from other guys in that, in that pack. What about um, the Ivy league when you were at Yale and, and this is going to be a, just across the board for the Ivy leagues, but what are the pros of playing, being a player in the Ivy league and what are the cons? Good question. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure there's any cons. I mean, there's some slightly different rules, but um you know, as far as, as, as workouts and things, and I'm not totally up to date on those, but um, I thought it was the best of, of everything. It was an unbelievable education. You know, we had our preseason workouts, we had our in-season games, we had um, postseason workouts. Uh, you know, the guys were getting uh, a great education. We still traveled to play, you know, play high major games, played mid-major games, played everybody in the country. Um, I think my first game there, we played UConn in the preseason at IT. Wow. <laughs> you know, it was a big change coming from my, my last game, at, you know, Williams versus Bowden or, or uh, you know, versus UConn. Um, you know, so I think the one thing that's helped that league is is the, the better players that are going there and the emphasis on recruiting. And, um, you know, now I think everyone's kind of increased their schedule, you know, and, and James said that a lot. We would play, you know, like I said, we play high major games and high major teams. Um if there was a negative, I would say, you know, there are potential negatives. There are no scholarships. So, um, you know, while you're getting a great education, there's going to be a lot of guys, you know, on the roster. So division one, obviously there's 13 scholarships, you know, maybe a couple walk-ons, um, not all programs use all 13, you know, or if they do, they used to have guys sitting out, you know, which they don't anymore. So maybe there were, you were competing with 10, 11 other guys to play, but, you know, if you're Yale and you have, 
four guys in every recruiting class, you know, that's 16. You know, one year you have five, you're getting to <laughs> 17, 18. So um, while the education and the experience is phenomenal, you know, there's certainly more competition for playing time, you know, with, with five guys on the court. Um, so that's always something to, to balance, you know. With that being said about not having scholarships, do you, do you know, and you might not know this, so I might be putting you on the spot here, but with the new NIL deals coming out, have the Ivy Leagues used that to their advantage to help offset some scholarship or to help offset tuition costs? Are you? I haven't heard that yet. That's a great question. Yeah. I mean, I think they, they made a change a few years ago as institutions to kind of meet everyone's need, you know, or if you were, um, I think most of them are need blind admissions wise, you know, so um, when I was there, there would, there was more of a, um, you know, you'd have a kid who was looking at the Patriot League, you know, it'd be like, hey, mm-hmm. Yale's going to cost me 35 and Holy Cross is going to be free, right? So depending on what you want to do or where your, your own financial situation or what you want to do with your life, because um, most of the guys that are going to go to the Ivy League have been offered Division One scholarship, right? Say, well, right? So um, on various levels, and that was probably true even 15 years ago. Um, kind of depends what you want to do, uh, but if they're meeting your need and you're going to, you know, one of the best schools in the world at a price you can afford. I mean, that's, that can be hard. That's a pretty good deal. That is a good deal. I just think of the families that make enough income where they're not going to qualify. Right. right. So the dad yeah. that makes 350,000 in middle America, who's going to, have to pay 60 to go to Yale, but can go to right. free to a Patriot league school. Now with NIL, is there an alum from one of these schools to say, Hey, just work for me during the summer and you're going to get right. paid that plus some. I just, yeah. I'm just curious the backroom talks that are going on. I haven't right? heard that, but that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the big, one of the biggest draws of those schools is the, um, you know, the alumni networks and their connections are uh, unbelievable. You right. Know, I used to tell that to the guys all the time, like, Hey, you, know, you guys forget the guys just on the team, the guy down the hall, you know, there's a chance he's going to be, you know, a Senator or something. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's one of the huge things about Yale and the new Haven pizza. Let's not forget that either, but uh, that's right. Well, Perfect. look, you and I, probably 99% of the kids that reach out to you uh, and I are guards, right? And the main goal that they all, majority of them want is to play D1. And there's such a fine line between um, getting to that level and not. And now that we have March Madness starting tonight with the fr- first four, um, a lot of kids can see D1 guards all throughout March Madness here. So tell me from being a former D1 assistant, what is the thing or multiple things that players can do on their own now to become a D1 guard? Oof, that's a good question. Yeah, I think the first thing <laughs> is to, the NCAA always puts out these um, these stats on their website about the likelihood of, of you, or when you play in high school, the like, the percentage of that population playing in college. So for college basketball on a whole, I believe it's like three and a half percent. So like 96 or 97% of high school players won't play in college at all. Mm-hmm. For division one, it's about 1%. Um, so you're talking about 99% of high school players are, are not, according to the stat. So, um, you know, I, I, a little bit like we talked about from going to Williams to Yale. I mean, I think it's, it's certainly there's got to be one thing or, or, or two things. You have to be competent in all areas. But what's the one or two things that um, you do at the highest level? You know, whether that's if you look at a, going from a skill set, so passing, defense, you know, guarding the ball. Uh, being able to guard different positions, you know, shooting is an absolute premium right now, you know, so if you're a guard and you can't shoot 40% from three in high school, you know, it's going to be really hard, probably at any level, but, but certainly at division one, um, because you're going to have such less opportunities. You know, if you take 18 shots a game on your high school team, you know, you might not play as a freshman wherever you go in college, but now you're going to have to go like two for four (laughs) or three for five or, or, or something like that. So, um, you know, the, the, the quickness and athleticism piece is, is, you know, I don't know how controllable that is. You know, that's, that's certainly a huge, huge factor. Um, again, size for your position, are you a 5'11 guard or a 6'4 guard? Um, you know, when you're watching TV, you're seeing um, big guards, you're seeing really athletic guys, you're seeing, um, uh, you know, high level athletes with, with the skill set. you know? So um, I think, Certainly the um, kind of stick to and intangible piece is important, you know, because I think wherever you go, again, you're likely that you're going to you start all over again your freshman year, you know. So if, you, if you're someone that is going to kind of get better and better and better, um, and as there's turnover and as there's transfers, you're still there. You're still there. <laughs> and now you're 
21 and under 22. And, you know, Colin Gillespie was really good as a freshman, but he's a fifth year senior now, you know, and now maybe there's someone who's a little quicker, but he's 23 and been, been playing these games a long time, you know. Um, so as you can keep, I think with anything, um, your coachability is huge. Um, if you're not humble and coachable, you're not going to get better regardless of your, regardless of the level. But if you're able to take instruction and, and take things that are being taught to you and take them on film and translate them onto the court, um, that, that just becomes more and more important when there's other obstacles, you know, whether that's all the kids that want to do it, whether there's, you know, how many six foot guards are there in the world, there's a lot, you know, so what are, what are those skills you can separate yourself with and then you know, I think the hardest thing probably for kids is, um, you know, basketball is a great sport because you can just take a ball and be gone for three hours, <laughs> you know, the park and shoot and work on your game and work on your handle. And there's all these guys that do, you know, a lot of the skill work, which is really important. But you also reach a point, certainly in college, where um, and probably our level of prep school, where you need to be able to do it in a game. You need to be able to work on things that happen in a game. You know, you can't work on your defensive rotations by yourself and you can't work on your, you know, nobody goes to the park and does closeouts or figures out how to get over and under a ball screen, you know, but as you get that opportunity in college, whatever it is, um, that's what coaches do. When they go back and watch the film, it's never like, oh man, we should have done two more, two more, you know, more two ball dribbling yesterday in practice or home. we should have. <laughs> You know, that skill stuff is important, but it comes down to how you can execute a game. So if you're a person that has a baseline of athleticism and, and has an, one or two things that you're elite at, and you can um, learn and get better and understand schemes, understand a scouting report and, and be invested in those areas, you give yourself a chance to get recruited. And even if it's, or to get better wherever you are, you know, because sometimes those things are hard to be seen. Those things are hard to see in high school, you know, and that's why coaches call us because they can see a game, but they can't, they don't know the back, you know, they don't know the other stuff, you know, so that's, that's the information that we can provide that, that they can't see with their own eyes. Um, but ultimately, at every level, and certainly at Division One, I, I think that separates guys when you see guys play more and more, all of a sudden they haven't played in two years, and then they're starting. <laughs> it's, um, it's a lot of those other other things, if that makes sense. Yeah, intangibles, absolutely. And kids think it's just like how many points they average a game. It's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Um, so since you did play and coach at the D3 level and then coach for so many years at the D1 level, like what are the – is D1 everything it's it's everyone thinks it is or they're or, – or not? Like is it is, is D1 all it's cracked up to be or are there <laughs> challenges that people just – in in high school don't know about that's going to hit them in the face once they get there. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's, there's challenges everywhere. There's certainly that the higher, you know, higher level you go, you know, there's going to be more for all those reasons, you know, there's um, everyone was the best player. Everybody's older. Everybody's kind of doing this, you know, everybody's got the strength coach. Everybody's got the gun. Everybody's, everybody's working out. Um, I think, adjusting to pace of play is always a big, big adjustment um adjusting to you know the again just really being efficient i think is one of the biggest things you know like if, if you miss more than you make and you turn it over more than you have assists like you're just you're not going to play very much you know um most guys have never not started now they're not starting you know and they say well i can't you know i, I can't just come into the game and be ready to play well like, well yeah, I mean, you have to, because, you know, so just, I think that's the benefit a lot of time, like we talk about, about depth stack and prep schools is they're, they're in those situations prior to college, you know, like you're not the best player here. This should be the best team you've been on. If you don't close out, like they're going to make it. Maybe not where you were, but here and certainly next year. Um, I, mean, I think there's more, I think the differences again are arena, you know, facility, gear, things like that. Um, notoriety, obviously. Um, but from a coaching standpoint, I think there's less, I mean, division three is, when I played division three, we worked out 7 AM Monday through Friday in the fall, you know, without a strength coach, but we just ran or played or did something, you know? So I don't know if I, I think division one actually has more rules, you know, as far as what you can do. So a lot of times division three and 
um, might do more because there's <laughs> might not be as structured, but it's not, oh, here's your four hours, you're done, you know. Um, but shell drill is the same, being on time for the bus is the same, watching film is the same, you know, ball screen defense, you have to learn. So I, I think the differences come in with those other things, either the external things, um, again, or simply, you know, is it, are you 6'4", 6'10", you know, but coaches want to win. They're gonna get fired if they don't win. <laughs> um, they want to have a really good team. They want to coach really good kids. They want kids that go to class. They want kids that aren't late for the bus. You know, they want kids that are doing the right thing. So all those things I think are are more similar at, at the different levels than you know than than totally different. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. And your your expertise being at those levels, I mean, makes you valuable. I think as a prep school coach, because now you can talk to your players and kind of give them a, a pure insight on what it's really like. With that being said, you know, you are at a NEPSAC AA school at Cheshire Academy. You're playing great competition. You've got great players yourself. When you're talking to families about Cheshire, what's your pitch? You know, why, why come play at Cheshire and uh, for you and, uh, and why go to school there? Um, it's a good question. I think it's, it's a combination of things. I think it's, um, you know, number one, you know, it is, it is certainly the background of myself or, or the, all the good coaches in the league. And I, I, I try to, whatever our guy, whatever I experienced in college, you know, at the different levels that I know is coming for the players in their tough freshman year, I want them to have that experience, you know, at Cheshire in, a, in an appropriate way, you know, so we're going to have a fall preseason, you know, where we live three days a week, we have open gyms and we have group workouts, we're going to do community service together, we're going to have team meals together. Um, we're going to watch film, you know, I'm going to tell you that's not, that's not a good shot. I'm going to tell you if it's not when maybe that, and some guys have never heard stuff like that before, you know, um, um, Hey, that's, you're not playing hard enough. That's just, it's, you know, kind of um, partly for their adjustment to the NEPSAC level, but again, the adjustment to where they want to get to, you know, um, kind of those things I just talked about at the end, not starting for the first time, you know, how do you handle that playing, maybe playing less than you've ever played. Maybe you are starting, right? Maybe you're not. Maybe it changes during the year, you know? Um, there's so many new um, experiences that I think are, are, are the ideas that they emulate college, but in a, probably in a more supportive way, you know, and with, with maybe less at stake than college. Um, I think same thing from a, a, a competition standpoint, um, you know, playing against better players, um, really being evaluated in that environment, I think is what is really important. You know, now it's it's huddle links, but I still used to get DVDs, <laughs> you know, and you'd get a DVD or something or there, here was this kid scored 30 points or 28 points. Um, and you really have, you have no idea what it means, you know, because you don't know who else is on the court and you're <laughs> trying to evaluate a center who grabbed 12 rebounds against someone who's 6'3", you know, and you're just, it looks okay. You just, you don't know. Whereas, you know, in some of our games, when there's 10 guys on the court, you know, all 10 are college players, some whatever, high major or division three, but they're all going to play. They all have that goal. You know, our eighth man is going to go play in college this year. That's usually, you know, that's usually different from different experiences for uh, depending on where kids are coming from um, and playing with other good players, you know, having to be more efficient, having to be in a situation where you, you, you see the right pass and you make it because that kid's going to make it. That's the right play to make and not, well, I thought he was going to drop it or he misses anyway, or, you know, some of those things that you get when the competition is not, not quite as high. Um, and then coaches being able to see that, you know, I think that's when you watch an upset game, when they watch an upset game, you'll see scholarship players score eight points, you know, or six points. And it's not, it's not about that, but they're, they're able to evaluate it and they're able to see it. Um, and then certainly the exposure that comes with it, you know, I think whether it's open gyms or, um, you know, showcases or individual games, Again, being able to see multiple good players in a good environment, you know, just just draws more coaches than going to see one single game, you know, is important. Um, and if you're the best player on the team, which is often the case for kids that are looking to come to, you know, as a post-grad or one of the best or, or something like that, um, you know, the coach is only coming to see you, right? Because no one, <laughs> they're all drawn because you're there. But if they're not there to see you, you know, you went there to NEPSAC school, they're there to see these three other guys and they're there to see this junior and they're there to see this sophomore and they're there to see this senior big guy, you know, and, and other, other, you're being seen by other coaches that, <laughs> you know, which I think is, I think is really important. Um, 
So, yeah. You mentioned something there that I think is fascinating about the prep school world is that you, even now with huddle accounts, you're looking at a player, you're talking to them, but when they show up on campus for that first workout in August, you don't know if they're going to be about the level you thought they were, if they're going to be worse, right? Or if they're going to be surprisingly better. Mm -hmm. Has that happened in your career where a kid showed up and you're like, whoa, he's way better than I thought he was? Certainly. Yeah. Yep. I won't say his name, but it happened this year. <laughs> Just positionally, you know, I thought, wow, he's much better passer than I thought, or he's much more of a point guard, or he's bigger than I thought, or, and sometimes it's the, it's sometimes it's those intangible things you don't know until you coach him. You know, it's like, hey, wow, he's, um, he really looks, when I, when, I, when I'm talking to him, he's staring at me, you know, he's got great eye contact or he's, he's like, yep, I got you. You know, or we watch film, he asks a good question or like he's trying to decipher. So the personality stuff you can see on, you know, in conversations certainly, um, but it is different. You don't, you don't really fully know until there's some, I don't say adversity, but you know, but, but yeah. some kind of inter inter interaction. Um, and then, you know, I think you do see because of the time commitment that they're putting to basketball, you do see improvement from, you know, end of August, early September to the season and then to um, postseason. You know, you do see kids really grow basketball wise over the course of their time. Yeah. And one thing, too, that I've seen probably one client a year, they'll go to prep school to do a post grad year and then they decide they no longer want to play college ball because they've learned during that year mm -hmm. that it's challenging. It's a lot more work than they think it was. And they mm -hmm. thought they would just show up and everything be handed to them and it's not. So right. it's just things that, that kids do. Yeah. yeah. And it's a good thing. It's, it's good to figure that out in prep school versus choosing. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're going to do a fun segment now, Jim, called famous alumni from Cheshire Academy. And I'm going to say names of three individuals and you're going to tell me if you know them or not, don't worry. You're not graded on this. I'm just curious. All okay. Right? First up, Robert Ludlam. I don't. So he's the author of the Born Identity series. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Number two, Talib Kweli. I do, but I don't. I, I do know him, but I, I'm not sure I can give you good information. <laughs> he is a rapper, uh, done yeah. a lot of work with Dave Chappelle uh, and Kanye, and I'm sure the, the kids know it <laughs> younger would. than us. I knew him from back <laughs> in my hip hop days, but yeah, Talib yeah. Kweli. Lastly, Eric Bloom. I don't know that. Okay, you're going to know three names after this I was this hoping you said James Vanderbeek. I know him from... That Varsity. was too obvious. Yeah, James Vanderbeek, <laughs> for you listening, uh, actor from Varsity Blues, Dawson Creek. Eric Bloom is the lead singer and guitarist for the Blue Oyster Cult. Ooh, okay. So there, now when you're talking... Common about office is going to be very upset with me. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Trust me. There are some... I, for other schools, I've really got to dig in and be like, this guy was a fourth-round draft pick for the <laughs> Texas Rangers in 82. So you guys have some famous ones up there. Yes, James Vanderbeek as well. So that was this week's segment of famous alumni from Cheshire oh Academy. God. So um, due to COVID, how has one, how has that changed you placing kids? And and second part of that question is due to how hard it's to play, how hard it is to place kids now at the next level, has that changed what kind of player you're taking on to your team? Um, good question. I think it it's changed it um i don't know if it's changed prep school or high school basketball it's changed college basketball so much you know which i think obviously trickles down so um you know guys can still see us play in person um there's still film you know there's the, the process has been the same there's still the aau we saw the nepsack showcase um you know i think uh, from the college standpoint uh, guys getting the extra year um, has been different, you know, certainly the, the transfer opportunities now have been different. So I think that's, I think the COVID is phasing out or is going to trickle out, you know, once, um, last year was different. Cause I think there was a lot more uncertainty with rosters, mm -hmm. you know, we not many schools played last year. We did play, we played just in state. Um, but there was a lot more talking to coaches. Hey, I don't know what position we need. I don't know what <laughs> scholarships we have, you know, and you probably had guys that went, um, you know, guys with division two off what division one offers at one point went division two, you know, et cetera. Um, I do think, and maybe this is, uh, I do think guys, kids have to be a little bit more creative in their path, you know, so we had a kid last year that, um, was looking at a really good division three program, or he was going to walk on as a preferred walk on kind of at a lower division one program that had a coaching change. 
And he went to that, he went to the division one program and played this year. He played about 12 or 13 minutes a game, you know? So I think with the scholarship numbers and with, with kind of the remnants of COVID kids having to figure out a little bit, you know, should I, um, you know, should I try a preferred walk on if this, that's really my goal, you know, to play at this level, should I, um, you know, go to this division two school, you know, maybe on a partial instead of this high division three school or this division one school. So I think that it's put more um, kind of options and thinking outside the box on the table, you know, um, and I don't know, again, I think COVID is going to, after this year, I don't say knock on wood, but it's going to tri trickle out as far as the impact of it. Um, you know, but certainly it doesn't look like, the, you know, the transfer opportunities will. I think that's certainly having a bigger, you know, will continue to have a bigger impact. Um, but I think it's, it's helpful for kids to know that. Um, and again, to, I tell guys, you know, always evaluate the school on its own, regardless of level. You know, I think with division two and division one, we have a meeting in the fall and we talk about recruiting them. Everybody knows the difference between, you know, uh, Duke and, um, you know, Vermont. I think, oh, they're all very different, right? Well, division two schools are not all the same <laughs> in finances and arenas and academics and the same thing. Division three programs are not all the same, you know? So, um, well, I'll just go division three. Well, there's top 25 division three programs and there's division three programs that are not, you know? So, um, you know, and I'll tell kids often, hey, if you visit these two schools and you didn't know the, I didn't tell you anything, the level, you'd be surprised which one you'd pick right. Right. <laughs> where you wanted to go to, you know? So I think just kind of reframing that in the process. Um, I don't think it's really impacted kids looking to take necessarily, you know, we're, we're looking to recruit. I think I do always want to see less about level, but do see a path for them in college. If that's their goal, do see, um, you know, uh, I think academics have becoming more and more important um, because, because of that unique, because of the uniqueness of the scholarship situation. So, you know, certainly at division two now, or it's always been the case, but the better student you are, most times they can give you more money. You know, you can get a better academic situation. Um, certainly at division one, you know, if you're looking to either, if you're not gonna get a full scholarship and you're trying to be a preferred walk-on, you better be a really good student and get into the school and <laughs> be low maintenance and be all the things that they're looking for. So it's, I think it's put an emphasis on certain things that were probably, you know, that should have been emphasized before, but there's more tangible things to point to now and say, okay, if I'm a division two school and I'm looking at two kids and, you know, Jim, you have a 2.2 and Corey, you have a 3.2. Well, you know what? Corey's going to get 20 grand in academic money. I only have to use a partial on him. I'm taking Corey 10 out of 10. And I think that's probably been the case, but even more so is heightened now. You mentioned about preferred walk-on. What are your thoughts on being a preferred walk-on? Because mm. I'm very, I got very strong thoughts on that, and I don't know if everyone really realizes the, the cons of it. I mean, they see D1, but I don't know if they realize yeah. the reality. I mean, so what I, do you I tell your it's, players? I, uh, it's a risk. I think it's a very big risk. Why? Uh, well, I, think, I should say that. It depends what your expectations are. right? So I, there's a difference between being a walk-on at a low-major school and being a walk-on at a high Right. Or, so the lower level, the lower the level, the more likely you are to be able to play in practice, be treated a certain way. You're not going to be, my sense would be if I was a walk on my main schools in a top five program, right, that I'm essentially another, I'm hitting players with the pad, you know, I'm rebounding for guys, I'm not participating, right? If I'm walking on at, um, you know, a, a lower to mid level division one, I might be a practice participant, right? Um, it depends how good I am. If I'm, um, you know, the kid who I mentioned before, he was a good player. He was probably in a normal year, you know, division two scholarship player. So for him going to a lower level division one school is not that much of a stretch, you know? Um, but, you know, when I was talking to him about it, <laughs> this goes back to my college days. The last thing the coach wants to hear is how much, how good you are and how much you're going to play and how much you're going to earn your way. And how you're going to get a scholarship. <laughs> I said, don't even talk about that. That's going to be guys saying, I don't want to deal with that. They've got 13 guys on scholarship. Or if you're the head coach, the last thing you want to be thinking about is, you know, this guy thinks he should be, you know, now he thinks he should be playing. So you've got to go into it with, um, I love the school. This is where I want to go to school. Um, 
I hope basketball works out. I'm gonna do everything I can to make it work out. If I don't ever get a scholarship, I'm gonna be fine. Um, I'm gonna be the most low maintenance person on the team. I'm gonna win every sprint. I'm gonna know every play. <laughs> um, it's a hard deal, whether you're kind of preferred walk on or, you know, I don't call it like a natural walk on, you know? So I think if the expectations are clear, but I think kids probably err in not having realistic expectations or not. And I think coaches, college coaches sometimes don't, are fully honest in, in the likelihood of things happening or not happening, <laughs> you know, um, because they don't want to be discouraging or, um, I think that's another area, sorry to jump where myself and I'm sure other coaches you talk to, I, I think we can get honest information from coaches, from college coaches. I think right. it's a huge right. piece of the green process because I've sat in that seat. I've made those calls. I know exactly what, um, they're looking at the board. I know exactly what they're saying. I know what, hey, we like you, but we want you to visit in a couple of weeks. I know what that means. That means there's somebody else visiting before you, <laughs> which just needs to be explained. But I think coaches are less, and I was probably the same way. You know, you don't want to say, hey, you're never going to get a scholarship here. You could say, oh, you're really going to have to earn it, right? But those are, how that's interpreted is, is different, you know, so. Um, but help me on this. You there is politics involved too. Like if a walk-on comes in and he's out playing a scholarship player that one of the assistants really touted, there's politics involved too. So where, where the walk-on might be better, you just can't let the walk-on overtake the scholarship player because there's politics involved with that as well. Can you explain that a little bit? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how often that would happen. You know, again, it would have to be in the right scenario where the walk-on is you know, really a lot better than they thought usually. Um, but yeah, I think it's like being a first round pick, you know, in the NFL, like you're, you're not going to get cut in training camp. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're gonna, you might get cut in year three, but you know, the undrafted free agent who's playing pretty well, he's going to get cut first, you know? So yeah, if it's close, um, you know, it's, it's probably going to go to the guy that they, that they invested in, or they saw something in more, right. Or they, or they, they think it's there and they're trying to get out of them or the ceiling's higher. Right. So we know what we're getting from this walk on. He's pretty good right now, but the, the scholarship guy has, we got to get him to his ceiling. His best is better than the walk on's best. Yeah. You know, yeah. If we can get him there. So there's all sorts of those kind of coaching, you know, things, things that go into it, but um yeah, certainly. I think there's if, if if they're giving you if they have 13 and they're giving you one of them and they're not giving me one of them, <laughs> then you know at that point that doesn't mean you're going to get mistreated or it's going to be a bad experience. But at that point, they're kind of telling you, hey, this is how we, right? This is kind of how we view it. You know. Um, now I do think um, a strategy, and I don't know if it's going to happen, but I do think a strategy for low to mid major schools could start to be. Um, recruiting more preferred walk-ons for continuity you know so if i'm a if i'm a low major division one school and i have two solid division two players as preferred walk-ons because they got academic money because whatever it is they can afford it this is where they want to go and i'm losing four or five guys a year right maybe i give them one eventually or now this guy goes from my 13th man all of a sudden he's my eighth man <laughs> yeah. he's a junior, you know so i think that's a little bit to be sorted out school by school but i could certainly see some rather than taking some rather than taking someone who you don't think is ever going to help you balancing that with hey he's not we don't really have that spot right now or we need this transfer or we need a big guy but you know what he's pretty good and, and he could be in our rotation at junior year you know when we're when there's all this other turnover. So I think that's something is, is, all, is going to be school by school, but I, I think that's something that'll be talked about and thought about in, you know, recruiting meetings. <laughs> and you mentioned expectations too. You know, I had two former players in Kentucky, one I coached that uh, both these players scored 2000 points in high school and both went to power five schools as walk-ons and they didn't last a year because they like the one, those kids like that can't sit on a bench. They just can't. And secondly, they came out being like, hey, I'm better than these players that are playing ahead of me. This is unfair. And that's a situation to where, you know, their expectations, who knows what the coach told them, but um, it, you got to go in with the right expectations. So I just think it's yeah. valuable for people to just, because I have a lot of kids like, I'll, I'll just walk on D1. It's like, do you know what that entails? In fact, I got a player now who's like, yeah, I want to just, well, I think I'm going to walk on a Baylor. I was like, that's a 
that's defending national champs. You're going to spend 65 K out a year out of pocket. You might not even sniff the practice floor. Okay. Are you okay with that? So it's all about expectations, but just people throwing out like, yeah, let's go walk on a Kentucky or this. I just don't think they have the No, and that's, I think the, 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 your point of the politics piece comes in a little bit more there, right? If you're the Baylor coach, you know, and um, the high school coach of Isaiah Austin calls you with a walk on. Correct. That's <laughs> or I call you with a walk on, right? Like just even getting that spot. And I think the last thing with the walk on piece is, um, is the timing. I mean, I think that's usually the latest thing to get an answer from, okay. right? So if I'm a Division One school, all right. So we have the tournament, or any let's say Division One because we're talking about it. Uh, tournament right now, spring break. I've got April recruiting. Right. I've got the um, who's coming back, who are my scholarships, where are we doing it? Who's going to be my walk on next year is not on the top of my priority list <laughs> if I'm a head coach. Right. So you can sometimes find out. Um, and what I try to find it is, hey, do you even have a spot? Right. If yeah. you have three walk ons and they're sophomores. All right. There is. A walk-on, right. Hey, we've got two senior walk ons. We have one freshman. We'll probably take one. more. So at least, you know, that's a possibility. But it might not align with when you want to make your college decision, you know, unless right. that's, which is, which is, you know, part of that timing process in the spring, you know, it might be, Hey, we're not really sure what we're going to do with it yet. You're welcome to come here and stay in touch, but <laughs> coach, you know, coach, coach is on vacation. We're spring recruiting. We've got workout, you know, we've got these official visits. It's just not, it's just not always high on the list. You know, life is all about timing, whether it's colleges, whether it's about relationships. Yeah. You want to hear my worst joke? Sure. Do you know do you know the difference between a good joke and a bad joke timing? <laughs> I told you it was terrible. I'm just, I hope I like that. We, we might just edit that one out. <laughs> <laughs> if people are listening to that in a speed and a half. There's ever a dad joke podcast. Call me yeah. back. I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> there you go. Um, so now to move on, let's talk about the NEPSAC a little bit. So you guys are in AA, very competitive. And parents are asking me a lot, like, well, this school's in AAA, this school's in AA, this school's in single A. What's the difference? Can you give me a breakdown of, of your thoughts and what the differences between the, the three levels are? Yeah, I think. And then it goes down to B and, and C and, and, and D, which maybe many of your kids aren't looking at. I think it's, you know, a couple of things. It's traditionally based on enrollment is one level to do it. You know, it's sometimes based on traditional um, schools, you know, so there's kind of leagues within A and there's leagues within um, B, you know, not just for basketball, but for, you know, the schools as a whole, um, at least in, at least here in New England. Um, you can be in different levels. The big difference from college is you can be in different levels for different sports. So it's not like, hey, we're all in the Big East. You know, it's a volleyball is in B and basketball is in double A. This is in A. Um, double A and triple A are the only leagues you can opt up into. So you can't um, choose to be an A. That's based on your enrollment, right? If you're a B, if you're a B school and you want to move up, you have to go to double A. Um, you know, or you could go over to AAA, or if you were AA, you could go to AAA. So there's some kind of logistical things that go into that. Enrollment is one, you know, certainly kind of emphasis on that particular sport, you know, in athletics. Um, I think the difference in levels basketball-wise is, um, you know, AAA is, is really a high level. There's kind of a smaller number of schools, you know, so there's some difference scheduling-wise there and traveling-wise. I think they have eight schools now. I think we have, I don't know if we have 14 or 15 in AA. Um, there can be different rules basketball wise, you know, whether it's length of game, A is 32 minutes, double uh, A is 36, and triple A is 40. Um, I think probably the depth of talent is probably the biggest difference. So there's really good players in triple A, there's really good players in double A, there's really good players in A. Um, I think the lower level you go, there's just less, less depth of them, you know, so the eighth man, you know, at a double A school or triple A school is still probably likely a college player <laughs> where maybe the eighth man at an A or B is a good athlete, you know, big time lacrosse player <laughs> who's playing hoops. Now the top A's got top three are very similar, you know, or there's, you know, high major guy at double A, there's a high major guy at triple A, there's a high major guy at A, right? And there's, but I think that the difference that can come in basketball wise is, is it's kind of the depth, you know, I would say. From what let, me ask, yeah, let me ask you this as a, 
As a D1 assistant, if you had the same player at a AAA school, AA school, and single A school, right, just for, for argument's sakes here, would it matter for you? If he's got the skill set you guys need, does it matter to you as a D1 assistant what level he's playing at? Um, it wouldn't matter. It would be part of my evaluation, though. You know, so I think um, I would be looking at him in a, you know, AAU. I'd be looking at him in workouts. I might be looking at him in some old high school film. Um, you know, so I'd want to see kind of the full composite, the full mosaic of that kid. So, um, and that, I think the difference there would probably be like the role, you know, we've talked about this, is it better to be a starter right. <laughs> at a lower level or the eighth man at a higher level, you know? And um, my thought on that is, is generally to kind of think about what the knock on you would be, you know, and then address that. So if you, if you're the starter and the best player in your town, but it's not a very high level of play, I'd want to know what can he do at a higher level? So I'd be totally fine. Seventh, eighth man, at double a because i've seen kind of the skill set in this environment hey he can score 30 in a game but i don't i don't really know what that means but hey you know what in this open gym or in this game he just guarded a kid you know uh going to sienna or do, you know whatever uconn and I, and I saw him in that environment you know um if my high school experience was the other way maybe i went to gonzaga right. <laughs> you know and i was the ninth or tenth man and i only played eight minutes but it was a really high level at that case, I'd want to see this kid. Hey, you might go somewhere and play 28 minutes. Yeah. And let's see, let's see everything, the flaws, you know, let's see the turn. It's let's see you turn it over. Let's see you, <laughs> let's see a broader, a broader evaluation, you know? So I think you're with the prep experience. It's the same thing with AAU. Maybe you play on an EYBL team and you don't really play very much. So if I come watch you play, this would happen all the time that when I was at Northeastern or Towson, um, you know, and I'd go watch a kid and they'd play four minutes and you would get nothing to evaluate. <laughs> You're like, wow, that was a high level game, but I don't know, he made his three or he went 0 for 1 or he went 1 for 1, you know. Um, they would print out box scores at Peach Jam. So you'd got to be like going through box scores, like, oh, did he ever play 13 minutes in this other game? And, you know, um, so I think you're just, you're trying to round out the picture, you know, but I, I think that the NEPSAC experience should kind of fill in a gap that you have. You know, if you have if you have a gap in competition, if you have a gap in exposure, if you have a gap in role, um, you know, and and the more common one is probably being kind of the best player, you know, in a lower level and then having to go up to the double A or whatever and play. Um, but and I mean, I'm probably biased to that at that, but I do think there's that's the value is being in that environment, you know rounding out kind of your profile. And then again, that's what's going to happen in college. So if you've never not come off the bench or if you've never not been taken out of the game because you just had two defensive breakdowns, it's coming. <laughs> Let's just have it happen in, in prep school rather than college, you know, and that's my experience. I will say that my experience probably at all the levels was the kids that struggled the most freshman year um, was twofold. It was either off the court um, because they hadn't been on their own yet. Mm -hmm. you know, so they hadn't had to get up and go to class. They hadn't had to, you know, get to study hall, take the bus to the gym, you know, figure out when they're going to go to bed, you know, their roommates playing video games, you know, whatever they can do on Saturday. They, they, they never had to deal with that before. And now it's going from zero to 60 and they can't just kind of manage their life off the court. You know, all of a sudden they got a C instead of an A, you know, they relate to study hall, whatever it is. And um, so I think that the, the NEPSAC environment puts you in that again earlier, you know, in a more supportive way. And then by the time they show up, you know, now the guy's 22, he's 23, he elbowed him, you know, the coach is yelling at him about their defense, right? And they've never, they've never had to be kind of a complimentary piece, you know, so um, they're just used to you know, Hey, you're not going to go three for 14. You know, you're just, you're going to get taken out or you're, <laughs> you're not going to shoot anymore, you know? So, um, that's why I do, I do err on the kind of, you know, let's say higher competition side or however we, however we look at it. But let me ask you this. If I'm a six, nine kid, right. Same clone. And you're a, once again, another college assistant, if I need a six, nine kid the following year in the next, next class, I'm going to go look at him, whether he's at single A, double A, or triple A, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 
Okay. So my big space or statement for a post-grad year is if money's even across the board at the schools you're looking at, you should pick your coach or your school based on your relationship with the coach and which coach you want to play for. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think that's important. I think the coach, I do think the level, you know, I think, um, you know, probably the fit on the team, you know, which is the hardest thing for us to say a lot because yeah, you, you know, the, the roster is going to change over so much. Um, but again, hopefully your conversations with the coach, you know, have been honest and, and you have similar expectations and you have more information. Um, you know, I, I do think, um, yeah, that kind of, it's like visiting college, you know, how do you feel about the coach you're going to play for? It's very similar, you know, even going through the post-grad process, I think helps families with the college process because you do similar things, you know, you make your list, you visit, you do the pros and cons, you look at the basketball, you look at the location, you look at the, the coach. Um, but yeah, I think that certainly in a post-grad year, you know, I'm going to see, you know, the, 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 the son five or six days a week from September 1st <laughs> until May 15th, you know, or, or whenever it is, our RPGs get out a little earlier in high school. Um, you know, and, and I'm gonna be hugely involved in, in, you know, not just their life at school, but their, their college process, you know. Um, and I think the, certainly the relationships that, you know, we have with coaches or they know where to come back and look, you know, I try to always be honest with coaches, you know, and I tell that to the kids, I'll help you with everything, you know, I'm not going to lie for you, <laughs> um, you know, but uh, coaches come back to our schools year after year after year, you know, uh, every year we have, new, you know, you have new schools come in the gym because of new players, but it's a lot of the same guys that you have relationships with. So you, we need, you know, we need to have honest conversations with them. And if we do the right thing, for the kids and we do the right thing with the coaches we're having contact with and we're building trust we'll, we're building our reputation um you know just like just like we would tell the kids to you know i tell the kids like you're responsible for your reputation so do you text people back do you call them back it's a small it's a small world you know especially you know if i'm a division two school and you want division one and i know i'm not going to get you i'm going to call three of my buddies at division one I'm going to say, cause I don't want to play against you or, <laughs> you know, I figured out, Hey, he's probably going higher. And now I'm trying to help you or I'm trying to help myself, you know, and I'm saying, Hey, this kid's awesome. You know what? We're not going to get him. Family's great. Kid's awesome. Or if my buddy calls me and says, Hey, what do you think of Corey? I'm saying, you know what? He never texts me back. I call him three times. He never calls me back. You know, that's something as simple as that is, you know, has, has an impact, you know? Yeah, there's too much uh, room for error out here. There's too much. There's too many kids trying to get so few spots. You have to lock everything up, right? Manners, getting back, good grades, good family. That's on top of basketball, right? right. And it makes it yeah. easy for a college coach because you don't text them back or you just say sup or you do <laughs> these little things that just could trigger a coach. You're you're done. So you, right. you know, and you get this too. With so many kids reaching out to you on a daily basis. If right. a kid in a in an intro email you know, is very clear and concise, you know, has their transcript highlights, why they want to come there, what their goal is, uh, this and that. You're going to look at it to where if someone just says, hey, coach, want to come there, want a scholarship, you can find me on YouTube. Well, that's too much work for you. And that's, that, then you have to reply back and not mm -hmm. saying you won't do that, but it just makes it an extra step to yep. where you want to make things as easy as possible. If you're a player, when you reach out to a prep school coach or an AU coach or a college coach, right? Just assume everybody out there is slammed for time. One of my buddies out there, he gets 300 DMs a day. I, like, I don't check them all. I was like, well, what do you do? What if there's good players that are in there? He's like, well, I miss them. And I said, how do you find players? He goes, people like you, my close source of friends, if they reach out to me with a player, then I'll get involved with it. But I don't have the time and the bandwidth in today's busy society to be checking all those DMs and especially the ones that tell you to Google something or, or look me up on YouTube. Right. You have to make it. An and, easy and, I'm, as and I'm judging that I'm judging that already and saying, if that's how the initial interaction is, is that kid really going to be a good fit? Can he really play? You know, you're, which is maybe not the right thing to do, but it's human nature. And I tell our guys the same thing. I met with everybody after the season and the underclassmen, and we're talking about, you know, reaching out to schools heading into the spring and summer. And I said, let's, we're going to get everything together. It's going to have, transcript it's going to have your AU schedule yeah. it's going to have the highlights from this season it's going to have my number it's going to and we're not going to send three piecemeal you know 
emails or clips. We're, we're going to put it all together and then I'm going to follow up with a call and then, you know, um, we're going to do it the right way. Cause that's not only is it going to help, it's going to help you for a variety of reasons, but it's, um, it's going to help the coach recruit you and it's going to reflect in a competitive when everything's being evaluated, right? That's just an easy pro. It's an easy check. <laughs> and you as a former D1 assistant too, you would get hundreds of emails a day too from randos around the world. So what did, is that what you clicked on or the ones that had in the subject line, like six, seven, 3.8 GPA class of 2021 from Gardini, California, like was the subject line, what would get you to click? Um, I would look, I think the body of the email, you know, was still important. I would look for, you know, I don't want a full game initially. I just want highlights because I want to see, you know, I don't think the time. I'm not going to watch 50 minutes. I want to see that even though it's not your flaws, I want to kind of see the best. Wow, well, he can really shoot it or, you know, they're really six, eight, whatever the size is, you know. And I think you want the information, you know, listing the people that you're, that are not just your parents, but your coaches, because I might know one of them. Right. Yeah. So if it's an email, oh, that's my buddy from so and so, or I'm placing you for John. I know, you know, you it it just helps give you a picture of where that kid's coming from. You know, um, yeah, and certainly then you're going to get into, um, you know, what you need basketball wise from your school or, or you know GPA or things like that. But yeah, you're looking for. I want it all in one one package. Yeah, yeah. yeah. make it <laughs> easy for the coaches. Huh? Make it easy for the coaches. Yes. All right. Yeah. Last question here with. COVID and the transfer portal and everything has recruiting or has placement changed timing wise now? Cause I know in the old days, and this still might be the case, a lot of movement and offers were, were passed out during the open gym period in the fall, but has that changed now to where programs are waiting to see who transfers out, who they get, and then they're going after prep school, high school kids, or, or what are your thoughts on timing now for, for kids choosing a school? I would say probably overall to that. Yes. Um, there's still some schools that, you know, there's still kids that are going to commit in the fall. But um, I think part of that is where, again, when the evaluation is being made. So if I'm seeing a kid for the first time at an open gym, I'm probably not going to extend an offer at that point. You know, I want to kind of develop the relationship or let's see you in a game or let's visit or let's go there. If I've watched you at an EPSAC showcase in July AAU and now I'm coming to your open gym to evaluate, but also show you that I'm interested in you you know, we're kind of at different stages. Um, so I think that, but yeah, I think there's, there's so much less for, you know, for division one, you could in the past chart out almost two years ahead, right? Like this class, in the senior class, we need this junior class. We need this. Now you really have no idea. Um, or they have no idea. So I do think it's gathering information. It's gathering, um, a list of guys, but I think there's probably less decisions being made, you know, in, in the fall and, and then, Certainly want to see during the season. Um, I don't think there's the, the transfer hasn't changed much in season recruiting. I think it's still kind of early or late, <laughs> you know, so for post-grad, I would say most tend to sign late anyway, you know, because if, if unless, you know, rather than September, October, when they first got there, <laughs> um, I think the in-season is still, everyone's kind of working on their season. And now from now until May is when you're going to see the most movement, you know, um, but I think it's, you know, certainly, you know, it's not just high school kids. It's there's a thousand other kids now that can be recruited, you know, yeah. and that's a huge, huge difference. Um, I was in, you know, there were grad transfers when I was at Northeastern and Towson and we recruited them. And that was for like a year or two, you know, where you knew, hey, I'll get, get the scholarship back. It's one year, he's 24. Um, now, you know, the most, now it's everybody's a grad transfer, right? So um, a freshman, who's on the rookie team in some league, you know, in the America East, just because we're around here, if they go to a Mac school, if I'm a Mac coach and that kid wants to leave, hey, he's a one-time transfer. So I'm getting him for three years. He's playing right away. And there's disincentive for him leaving again. Yeah. He's got to sit pretty, good, pretty good recruit, right? So um, I used it. We, the Mac, because we're down the street from Quinnipiac, you know, there's 10 schools. It's kind of clean. It's a Northeast league, but when we talk and when I talk in the fall with our guys, I said, right, let's say the Mac, let's say they need five point guards. Okay. All, all the schools. Some, you know, they don't, that's just whatever. Who can they recruit? High school kid, prep school kid, junior college kid. Um, maybe a little more regionally, you know, I'm not sure, you know, Iona and Manhattan are going to recruit California, but up and down the East coast for sure. Junior college in Texas, Oklahoma, for sure. And now, a college kid, division one, two, and three. 
right? For five spots. Um, and then you, you, could, you could flip that with like an Ivy League or Patriot League where they are not gonna, they're less likely to recruit junior college and less likely to recruit a transfer because you know, Yale's not gonna take all the credits from yeah. you know, a Mac school, right? But their high school reaches so much further because they are recruiting California, they are recruiting Texas and everywhere, right? So, you know, they, if there's five point guards that are needed in the Ivy League, yeah, you've gotten rid of Juco and transfers, but you've added a swath of, of high school kids. So um, it's, it's, you know, there's just a lot more supply, you know, it's, there's just a lot more supply. So I think in the past, you'd see post-grads or et cetera would kind of go to a level too high in the spring. You know, so you'd see that you were the best available high school guy, you know, and maybe you had an Atlantic 10 offer and all of a sudden you ended up in the Big East. <laughs> yeah. And that was maybe a good fit or not. And then you, you transfer. Um, you know, now I think there's certainly more to be said. If you have an opportunity early, take it. You know, if it, again, if it checks all your criteria, you don't ever want to go to a school you don't want to go to. Yeah. But there's, um, if it's, if it's the, you know, if it's, if it's October or November or it's early signing date or you're a division, you're a really high academic division three kid and, and Williams wants you to go ED. I mean, I, I think most myself and I think I'll speak for most coaches are going to say, Hey, you better be all over that. <laughs> yeah. I tell you what, I would not want to be a D one assistant nowadays. Cause just, you could, you could have a 48 hour day and still not oh, yeah. do a good job, but I was with a coach. I was at a high school game last night, and I was standing next to the Division One coach, and he had um, he, he had a, port, it was like notifications on his phone, you know, for like the portal. He's like, it just beeps like every, uh, <laughs> he beeps all day long. <laughs> all right, we are going to finish up here with lightning, lightning round. All right. Hope I do better than alumni. The, yes, <laughs> well, this is not a quiz. This is actually your okay. personal answer. So all right. All right. The biggest win of your career, both as a D1 coach and as a prep school coach. Oof. Uh, biggest win as my assistant career was when I was at VCU, when I was at Northeastern, um, we won at VCU, um, who was like the pinnacle of our league in a crazy environment. It was our third year. We were rebuilding with Eric Maynard, Larry Sanders, and um, it was just a high, high level game. And I just remember, you know, being in a locker room after like, wow, that was that was awesome. Um, prep school. Oof. Um, I'll say probably my first one. <laughs> first time as a head coach, our first win uh, three or four years ago was just like, all right, got we got it, got it, got it over my, got under yeah. my belt. <laughs> you'll never, for, you'll never forget that one. Yeah. Uh, best player you've ever coached against, both as a D one assistant and as a prep school coach. Uh, it was one game, but we played Kansas when they had Wiggins and Embiid when I was at Towson. So I don't, I don't know how much coaching I did against them, but it was uh, they were <laughs> they were on the court. Um, they were there for those forty minutes. Uh, prep school, uh, the kid uh, Kyle Filipowski. Oh yeah, was, uh, Duke. Yeah, he's he's tremendous. When you were at Towson, did you play Oregon State when Obama's brother-in-law was there? So the year they did the year before I got there, we went to Oregon State. It was like a two for one. So we went my first year there. We had to return it. So we went to Corvallis. <laughs> um, well, I was there that year in Towson. Not an easy and, place to get to. <laughs> no, no, it's not. But I was there uh, at that Towson game because I knew one of the assistants at Oregon State, and I got tickets in the section Obama was sitting in, and um, that was pretty neat. Cause it was all cordoned off. I had to go through security. And Bill Murray was there too because his yeah. son was an assistant at Towson. Luke, so, yeah. so anyway, we had to all wait in the arena while Obama leaves, and Bill Murray is just sitting there by the band, and and all these kids just start coming up, and he, he just it was interesting to have that kind of firepower in a Towson game. <laughs> a little there. Towson versus Oregon. Yeah. Uh, what are your hobbies when you're not coaching? Um, I like run, runs and walks. I got three little kids, so and a dog now, so looking after them <laughs> that's a good answer and lastly what is your favorite movie um i'll go a few good men oh crystal <laughs> on a, rainy, on a few good men on a rainy sunday is that whatever rusty shoots out <laughs> oh, perfect well jim where can people find you uh on the interweb uh the coach cheshire academy my twitter is uh oh my, actually i don't even know my twitter handle. Can we redo that 
<laughs> uh, people can find you. They type in Jim McCart- McCarthy. They'll find yeah. you. On Twitter. Um, I'm not on, I'm, I'm still low. Okay, I don't do IG yet, but uh, on, on Cheshire Academy website and on my Twitter. Okay, perfect. Well, we uh, want to thank Coach Jim McCarthy of Cheshire Academy for joining us today on the Prep Athletics Podcast. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms. Uh, YouTube, you can subscri- subscribe there as well as we have bonus content that pops up every now and then. And if you ever have any questions about prep school basketball, feel free to reach out to me. All my contact information is at prepathletics.com. Jim, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much, Corey. I appreciate it. Good to talk to you. Yeah, likewise, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks so much.